Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. It's good to see uh, when uh, I saw the kids come up here and I saw uh, Chuck and Sharon's granddaughter. I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, but with the cotton blonde hair. This memory comes into my mind of growing up and going to Petersburg, Texas all the time where my family was. And I knew when we go, we were going to play with Kippa, Casey, and Cammy. And that, that was always the, the way it went, Kippa, Casey, Cammy. It was never <laughs> individuals <laughs> like that. So it's good to see Cammy here this morning. All right, I'm doing good. <laughs> but it's good to see everybody here. I'm glad y'all are here today. Uh, today we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Let's take a moment to prepare our minds to hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful to be here this morning. Thank you for calling us out and allowing us to gather before you in your presence. And we know, Lord, that this week, as we have gone about our lives, that we have done things or we have ignored things uh, that are out of line with the way you would have this world be. And we ask that you forgive us. You help us be the kind of people you want us to be, Lord. And we say that because we know that 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 confession is immediately met with forgiveness and joy by you. And we're so grateful for that. We ask, Lord, that as we dwell in your word, that you help us learn how to live well, that you give us words of strength and words of comfort, but also words that uh, ask us to, to grow and to stretch. Be with us this morning. It's your son's name, I uh, pray. Amen. So I'm going to ask you a question, and I want want you to think of the feeling that you have when you ask this question and the situations that might come up around this question. Here's the question. What do I do with this? (laughs) Has anybody ever had a a response to a situation in your life and you, you say, what do I do with this? The student turns in a paper that's both poorly written and plagiarized. (laughs) And as a professor, I ask, what do I do with this? The cat proudly trots into the room and leaves a dead mouse in your lap. (laughs) What do I do with this? You receive a gift that doesn't land quite right. Uh, One year I got a Death Star waffle maker for for Christmas. (laughs) And I ask myself, what, what do I do with this? You might think make waffles, but it turned out it would take 15 to 20 minutes to make one waffle with this waffle maker. You find out that the person you really like likes you too. They like you back. You feel joy and anxiety. What next? What do I do with this? You didn't get one, but you got two very good job offers. That joy and anxiety, again, what do, I, what do I do with this? This is a good feeling. So you can imagine all of the different situations that would move a person to ask that question. What do I do with this? Many of them leave us perplexed, stumped, and sometimes they leave us in awe and wonder as we're left to discern what to do next. This is a question that comes along with the Easter proclamation. Christ is risen. Okay, so what do we do with that? How do we feel about this news? What emotions does this evoke in me? What actions does it lead to on my part? In Acts chapter 2, we see that these early Christians, these first Christians felt awe and wonder. In 2023, how do we feel about it? What do we do with this story. 
I have to be honest, I, I've struggled to figure out what to do with this very short text as I've been preparing for this sermon because there's just a depth of riches with these five verses. But for one, it comes at the heels of one of the greatest sermons ever preached. Jesus has ascended to heaven. His small disciples, they're gathered together in a, in a room on Pentecost wondering, what next? They've just witnessed the wonderfully unexpected Jesus raised from the dead. And then on top of that, Jesus ascending to heaven. And then the Holy Spirit showed up. A rushing sound of violent wind filled the house that they were in. And tongues of fire rested on the heads of the apostles. And then they were able to speak the, in other language, languages so that Jews from all over the Mediterranean world and Roman Empire could hear them and understand what they were saying on that Pentecost day. Of course, you have to imagine everyone was wondering, what do we do with this? So Peter does what Peter does, and he speaks up and he preaches a sermon. He quotes the prophet Joel. He quotes a psalm from David. He helps his audience understand who Jesus did, or excuse me, who Jesus is. And then the text tells us that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. Greatest sermon ever. Until the next chapter when he preaches again and 5,000 people get added to the church that day. At this point, you might be asking yourself, is Peter still available? We could use a few dozen more people, uh, let alone 5,000 at our church. The elders here might be thinking, how can we motivate Jeremy to preach better sermons when he preaches? But it's not just about preaching, is it? It is everything that led up to that point. Jesus dies, and against all odds, he's raised from the dead. Mark tells us at the very end of his gospel that the women who learned about his resurrection from an angel <coughs> excuse me, in a tomb went out and fled from the tomb for <coughs> excuse me, tickle throat, for terror and amazement seized them. Terror and amazement. Luke tells us how Jesus appeared to the disciples after his walk to Emmaus, and they were startled and terrified at his appearance. John shows us what could have only been an emotional, intense meeting between Jesus and Thomas. <coughs> Sorry. Thomas doesn't believe it, but then he sees, hears, and touches the resurrected Christ. And Thomas's only response was, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus ascends, and the Holy Spirit comes, and then the apostles speak in tongues, and then Peter preaches, and then what do we do with this? What must they have been feeling? Put yourself in their place. When the worst seemed inevitable, the unimaginably, unimaginably best and unexpected happened again and again and again. <laughs> J.R. Tolkien, the Lord, the <coughs> excuse me, the author of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, called this kind of thing this unimaginably wonderful thing. He called it. Oh, thank you. There's a cold going through our house, and I feel like it's emerging in my throat as I'm <laughs> preaching this morning. What do we do with this? <laughs> <clears throat> Let me take a step back. So when the worst seemed inevitable and unimaginably best uh, and the unimaginably best and unexpected happened again and again and again, it's just amazing. J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, he called this kind of thing a you catastrophe or a good catastrophe. Something so good and so unexpected that it can only be described as an amazing act of grace that is unbelievable in its scope. In his books, it's Gandalf showing up with Faramir at the last second of the Battle of Helm's Deep, the riders of Rohan showing up at Gondor when the city is about to fall to an army of orcs, when the eagles come at the very end to rescue Sam and Frodo from an inevitably fiery death. In Christianity, it's a bl it is blind men healed, bleeding women cured, children returned to life, Lazarus raised from the dead, and Jesus resurrected. Have you ever experienced a you catastrophe in your life? 
My parents might say that when I met Vanessa, it was a you catastrophe. <laughs> when things were beyond hope, here she came. Or maybe if I'm honest, that's how I felt. Maybe the doctors told you there was no hope for having a child, but beyond hope, you got pregnant. Maybe you're at the point where you were deciding between paying for groceries or the electric bill, and somehow the money came through for both. Maybe the relationship with your daughter seemed so broken that there was no hope of recovery, but then one day she shows up ready and willing to pick up where you both left off. In all of these situations, from Tolkien's book, books to, Christ, to the Christian story, to our own stories, it leads us to that feeling behind, what do I do with this? We feel awe and we feel wonder at what <coughs> happened. So in preaching this text, what do I do with it? Does it evoke the same sense of awe and wonder that it did in this first church in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47? The first people to hear this text would have been familiar with the kind of utopian vision that we see laid out before us. It was widespread in Greco-Roman literature at the time. One of the primary characteristics of these communities was sharing of personal possessions. Jewish hearers, uh, for them it would have evoked visions of shalom and jubilee from the Old Testament. For us, it feels like an impossible standard that our churches today could never live up to. In fact, I googled it. That's what you do, right? When you're trying to figure out what to do with something. I searched for sermons on Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and I found sermons with titles like, The Church Unleashed. <laughs> the Church You've Always Wanted. And A Snapshot of a Healthy Church. Whatever it is, Luke gives us a vision of a newborn church where the deepest human longings for God, community, and basic provision were met in abundance for everyone there. This is something that could have only happened through the work of the Holy Spirit, not something we program into the life of the church. When we read this text, Acts 2, 42 through 47, we often don't know what to do with it. Like I just read, we hold it up as maybe a standard for what the church should be. <clears throat> But read further, in Acts chapter 5, Christians like Ananias and Sapphira had already misunderstood what was happening in this community. By Acts chapter 6, Greek widows were being overlooked and underserved in the community. The church <coughs> is already failing. Is this an impossible standard for us to follow? Is the early church too much for us to follow. Sometimes when we look at this text, we also impose modern political and economic systems on what we read here. Words like socialism and communism um, come to the surface and the Bible rubs up against our American free market sensibilities in uncomfortable ways. What do we do with this text? What does it mean for us? If we focus on patterns or models, or political and economic systems, I think we miss something. I think we miss the point. Perhaps we should focus on the emotion of the text and the response that that emotion brings uh, out of it. Those early disciples felt awe, wonder, and amazement. <clears throat> Their response is evidence that these recent events are God-driven and not rooted in human ambition. The God of Israel is once again showing God's covenant faithfulness. With the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God is fulfilling promises of prophecy. The kind of church we see in Acts 2 exists out of the people's response to the Spirit working among them. While our reflections of this text often focus on the actions of the early church, let's focus our attention to the emotional response of awe and wonder. What do we do with this? What do we do with this? The Christian life is about adjusting ourselves to the existence of a gracious God. Acts shows us what that adjustment looks like. The appropriate response, the appropriate emotional response to the Spirit is amazed appreciation, awe, and wonder. 
As we sit together this morning, we need to be aware, we must be aware that God's divine presence is here with us now and in this place. The Holy Spirit has shown up among us mortals to remind us and show us God's wondrous deeds that can interrupt our ordinary lives. Take a walk this week. Marvel at the natural world and wonder at the generous graciousness of a God who chose to include you in the great gracious gift of creation. Think back to the last time you were in a large crowd. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people witnessing a special event of natural or cultural beauty that moved you beyond yourself to feel united with these people in awe and wonder. I think of a man <clears throat> I think of a man who grappled with alcoholism for mu much of his career at a conservative Christian university and had the courage to stand up in chapel to share his struggles with his students and his colleagues. I felt a sense of awe and wonder as Stacy Patty told us about those struggles, what humbled him, his support system, and what he's doing about it now. It was you catastrophic. A story of, of spirit-filled, amazing grace unexpectedly erupting into our broken and mundane world. As I've been talking, I hope you've been remembering. Remembering those moments that filled you with awe and wonder. A child born, an evening of worship and fellowship that just hits you in a different way than others do. A coming together and an emergence of new relationships. I wish we could go around the room <clears throat> and hear your stories of awe and wonder this morning, have time to encourage each other with those. What did you experience, and what did that experience lead you to be? What did it lead you to do? The awe and wonder that we feel points us toward God because they point us beyond our common awareness to the beauty and the mystery that always surrounds us, that's so much bigger than we are. So let me give you some homework. As you're going in the world this week, find the awe and the wonder around you. Find it in nature, even in Lubbock, Texas. Find it in your relationships. Find it in the church. Find it in the Spirit of God. And as we find ourselves in awe of the generous graciousness of God and ask ourselves, what do we do with this? May we learn to be a generous and gracious people. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we're grateful for how you act among us. And I confess, Lord, that as a human being, sometimes I take those gracious acts for granted. I let them become normal in every day instead of understanding them for the awe-inspiring things that they are. Help me to slow down. Help all of us to slow down, to take a moment and take in what you've done in this world around us. And Lord, we ask that you make us into people of generosity and hospitality so that we can share your spirit and your love and your grace with those around us. And it's your son's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat>